Today we have our consult member, we have Dr. Corey Goldberg presenting for us. Thank you so much for being here. Dr. Corey Goldberg is a licensed clinical psychologist, certified EMDR therapist, therapist, and the founder of Shore Therapy Center for Wellness, located in North Shore, in the North Shore of Chicago. She works with adults to address the impact of anxiety, stress, burnout, and trauma in their lives with specializations in parent and caregiver burnout, trauma and PTSD, and affir affirming therapy for marginalized populations, including neurodivergent individuals and the LGBTQIA plus community. As a SIPAC psychologist, she's also licensed to provide therapy via telehealth in over 35 states across the U.S., a passionate lifelong learner and teacher, Dr. Corey Goldberg has served as adjunct facility for the Family Institute at Northwestern University, supporting the graduate education of therapists in training, and is currently developing on-demand online courses for parents and kids with high support needs to address parent burnout and to support effective and affirming parenting for neurodivergent kids and children with high support needs. Um, Dr. Goldberg, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Ellie, and I really appreciate all of the support that you have provided to help me feel prepared and um, comfortable in presenting today. So I really appreciate that. Last year, I talked kind of exclusively about Ross Green's Collaborative and Proactive Solutions Model as a tool for uh, families, and um, I've been working with the model for about 10 years now. I've been presenting the model for about six years, and over more recent years, as I've continued to uh, focus my practice work more with neurodivergent adults and with parents of neurodivergent kids, I've increasingly kind of modified the model to fit within a broader framework of what I think of as kind of effective communication for problem solving. And in addition, kind of the broader framework that I tend to do with these individuals when we're working in my office um, so that it aligns more um, more fully with neurotypes such as autistic, gifted, ADHD, ADHD, twice exceptional, what have you, other neurodivergent um, or divergent neurotypes. But as I said, to kind of focus more broadly within this idea of what is effective communication for problem solving, because some of the maybe rules or expectations around communication that are effective when dealing with neurotypical individuals aren't effective um, when dealing with divergent neurotypes. Um, as Ellie mentioned, thank you, Ellie. Um, I am a licensed clinical psychologist. I am an EMDR certified therapist and I'm a licensed school psychologist as well. And the reason I sort of mentioned that is I um, I always knew that I wanted to be a clinician. I always knew that I, I wanted to do therapy work, but it, throughout my training, I really came to see how impactful systems are towards people's experiences and to what they bring into the therapy space. And so looking at things like family systems, school systems, understanding some of those broader systems was really helpful for me um, and important, I think, to consider as I work on the presenting problems that people bring in and the struggles that they're experiencing within their lives and their households. I am the founder of Shore Therapy Center for Wellness on the North Shore of Chicago, and I am a SIPAC um, psychologist, which I really appreciate allows me to make uh, the work accessible across states. Um, I specialize in treating anxiety, stress, trauma, and burnout for marginalized adults, um, as mentioned, and for parents and caregivers of individuals with um, the high support needs. And um, once again, as mentioned, I am working to develop online learning for parents and caregivers, particularly that's on demand to reduce some of those barriers of access and affordability um, and scheduling availability for parents who are really recognizing that they don't have the tools to meet um, the expectations and the needs within their household in an effective way and are looking for help with that because they're, they're struggling and they want to struggle less. They want to support their children and their families and themselves more effectively. And um, it's not always easy to find that help that is aligned and affirming. Um, I find that it's helpful for me to presence why I do what I do and um, when whether it's the work that I do, the presentations that I do. And I encourage this with my clients as well is to really look at that kind of values to drive one's actions. And so in absolutely no particular order in a non-exhaustive list, these are some of the values that I hold that contribute to why I talk about um, these issues and why I kind of 
like to build these skills. And what it really all boils down to for me is to reduce unnecessary human suffering. Um, there is sort of ordinary pain, but there's that suffering that is on top of the ordinary pain. And that's where I really see us being able to make a difference and move the needle. Um, and so that's what drives a lot of the work that I do. So in my work as a neurodiversity affirming trauma therapist and as a human being um, navigating the earth, uh, I recognize that we live in a society that was built for neurotypical people, um, but people of many divergent neurotypes also exist within society um, and are often struggling to function within the parameters of a society and of systems that were not designed with their needs in mind. Um, and so neurodivergent folks are often being subject to being misunderstood, uh, marginalized, gaslit, abused, what have you, and are struggling within many systems and many relationships within their lives, um, which may be important to them where they may wanna have success, but there, there are barriers. And so this can contribute to um, unnecessary human suffering. Additionally, uh, I work with a lot of parents of neurodivergent folks, and the parents themselves are often marginalized and under-supported and ineffectively guided and under-resourced and ill-informed and are being held responsible for struggles within many systems and relationships that, once again, aren't built to accommodate them or their parenting or their family's needs. And um, that can contribute to uh, trauma and difficulties for themselves and for others as well. Anyone, when we are pushed past our capacities, when we aren't supported to meet the needs that are there for us, um, we become dysregulated and that can be really impactful and ripple out in uh, detrimental ways for ourselves and for other people. And I also note that I work with a lot of overlap uh, given the heritability of neurotypes like ADHD and autism. Um, many parents of neurodivergent kids are themselves uh, neurodivergent. And that can um, complicate how they perceive and respond to their children. It can have them bring some of their own experiences, some of their own um, unhealed wounds, and that can impact um, the struggles that they may have to be effective in addressing the challenges that, they're, that their children are experiencing and reducing those challenges. Uh, so there's a lot of um, trauma and stress and challenge that comes from trying to function as an individual, as a parent, or both in systems that aren't built with your success in mind um, and where you're not well understood and where you're not well supported. And it's important, um, although very much not easy to influence and try to change some of these systems uh, to be more aware, more inclusive, more affirming, and um, that's a heavy lift. And I think that it's a heavy lift that we're all working in our own ways to contribute to, to doing. Uh, but as I look at things, the family system seems to be sort of low hanging fruit, that place where some of these grassroots efforts to change the experience of um, neurodivergent people can be really effective because um, being marginalized and oppressed and misunderstood within your own family dynamic uh, is, is um, unnecessary human suffering. So starting to talk with neurodivergent folks and families about viewing the struggles that they're identifying as problems to be solved and bi-directional empathy and understanding as being essential to effective problem solving. And in doing this, we can reduce the unnecessary human suffering and trauma. We can address it at that level and start there or at least affect some change there. So I realized that challenges of living as a neurodivergent person in a neurotypical world are complex, they're multi-layered. It's not as simple as saying, here's how to talk to your kids about having problems, but that is a piece within this larger piece when I work with parents um, that has a lot of psychoeducation, a lot of skill building, a lot of healing work that goes into my work with parents. Um, and so when, parents come in, oftentimes by the time they come in and are seeking out therapy support, uh, they come in with all kinds of problems that they're identifying, all, all different ways that they recognize that they're struggling, that their kids are struggling and where they feel um, ill-equipped 
to support their kids in navigating those struggles. And so they start to feel hopeless and helpless and out of control. Um, they may have strained relationships with their children. They may have disagreements with their co-parent about how they should be responding um, to the struggles that they're seeing with their children. They may feel guilt or shame about um, being dysregulated, losing it with their children, not parenting in a way that's in alignment with their values. They may be struggling with burnout as they are trying to protect and shield their own really dysregulated nervous system. You know, that I love that um, chart that Bobby Joe shared about the polyvagal theory that really shows that kind of red zone, that burnout place. And the burnout place is not um, a place where effective parenting is really um, going to stem from. And, you know, while refrigerator parenting has sort of died out as a uh, theory that's commonly spouted, um, it is still there um, in a lot of the feedback that parents get that if they have a kid who is struggling in all these different ways and the common variable is it's their kid, then there is often the implication that it's their parenting. Uh, and when parents are trying and working really, really hard to get access to supports for their kids, to support their kids in a way that will be effective, and they're noticing that it is not working and they don't know what to do, um, that can be particularly painful feedback to get. Um, so uh, some of the things that I try to bring into my work with parents is validation of their experience um, and of some of their struggles, a lot of psychoeducation uh, that might help them better understand their child, better understand the systems in which their child is being asked to function, in which they are being asked to function, um, radical acceptance and values-driven committed actions, as I said earlier, really focusing on values and having that drive how they address their parenting, building awareness of their own nervous system activation and tools to support regulation. Once again, using that kind of polyvagal theory and psychoeducation there, learning how to notice the, the interoceptive piece. What does it feel like? How are you regulated or dysregulated in your body? And how can you um, support regulation there? Identifying their own narratives, their own isms. Oftentimes there's a lot of ableism to identify and internalized ableism that's there, their own activating cues. There may be trauma work to do from their past, um, working on compassion and self-compassion, how to bring that into some of the challenges that they're experiencing. As I mentioned earlier, kind of reframing this idea of the problems that you're having are indicators of struggle, struggles that you're having, struggles your child is having, struggles um, interacting with systems um, or even within the household or within family dynamics, and then building the capacity to identify and use more effective communication and interventions to um, compassionately address these struggles in a way that's in alignment with your value and that helps you feel safe and regulated within your body and safe and regulated within your household and within your family system. So that is where this piece fits in, where I use the collaborative and proactive solutions model and this broader idea of um, effective communication for problem solving is this piece of it, um, building the capacity to identify and use more effective communication and interventions. So what is the collaborative and pro, um, proactive solutions model? Um, it's a, at its core, it is a structured communication model. And I like that piece of it. Um, the, the CPS model, and I'll talk about this on the next slide, it was not designed um, with neurodivergent people in mind. Um, but there are many aspects of it that are kind of neurodivergent aligned um, in their components. And so the structured communication model, having a structure and predictable way in which we are going to engage around struggles when they arise can be helpful. It's like scripting. It's, it's developing sort of family um, system, a, a clear family path around what we do in this situation. The CPS model is aimed at solving problems in a collaborative way, and it emphasizes very much the importance of understanding and addressing the concerns of all the involved um, parties and systems. And this also is really nicely uh, neurodivergent aligned in that um, it's bottom up in its approach. And I'll talk a little bit more about top down versus bottom up in a moment. Um, but it also takes away that idea of power dynamics and hierarchies. It's not, um, there, there is collaboration, both people's experiences, thoughts, um, and participation is equally value, valued and needed. 
Um, so it's not just about, I'm the parent, I set the expectations, you need to conform to them. Um, it removes that hierarchical piece of it. And um, lastly, it aims to support meeting expectations by identifying and removing barriers to success. And that really is sort of as partnered with that step above that, that the, the idea that we need to understand what's going on here and what's contributing to the struggle that we're having. And in order to remove the struggle and meet the expectation, we need to know what the barriers are to meeting that expectation and work together to remove those barriers. Um, and that's that sort of really bottom up piece. We really need to understand what's underlying the struggle that we're having in order to effectively address the struggle that we're having and resolve the problem. So a very brief history um, of kind of the evolution of the CPS model. Uh, it was developed by Dr. Ross Green initially um, to address problems and problem behaviors that were seen with children who are often characterized as being oppositional um, or defiant. Once again, it wasn't um, designed for neurodivergent kids, but there were probably a lot of neurodivergent kids within the, the group that was being identified and targeted. Um, and I really like that the way that the CPS model conceptualizes a problem, that a problem exists when there's an expectation that isn't being consistently met. So that's not to say the problem is your failing. Um, the problem is you. The problem is your abilities, capacities, um, or execution. The problem is that there's an expectation and there's a struggle to um, consistently meet the expectation, which also leaves space for maybe a component of the problem to address and identify is maybe the expectation isn't an appropriate expectation. Maybe it's not realistic. Maybe we're not adequately supporting the individual um, so that they can meet the expectation. So historically, um, society and parents as um, members of that society have utilized top-down approaches um, when there's a problem that that the focus is on the goal, is on meeting the expectation. And so the way we're gonna solve that problem is just focusing on how do we tick the box? How do we say that the expectation is met? And oftentimes that has been um, addressed by kind of superimposing a general solution to a problem. And usually that general solution is to make it uncomfortable to not meet the expectation. So we are going to up the ante by dangling a carrot, by incentivizing meeting the expectation, or by threatening a stick, by making it um, scary or um, sad or what have you to not meet the expectation. Now, these um, top-down approaches may work uh, for a little bit or in some situations or for a little while, but it's important to consider at what cost. Um, using these kind of top-down approaches, superimposing a solution without really understanding why the problem is being experienced at all, um, it it's leveraging a position of power um, and it may erode a sense of trust and safety within the relationship. It may foster fear, resentment, and ill will within the relationship dynamic. And additionally, while the child may be able to really pull from their resources, like grit their teeth and power through and try to meet that expectation, um, it's unlikely that they can do that long-term um, or that they can do it every time that solution is applied to a problem. If we leverage that power position and that's the solution to every problem, it's not, it's just not going to work for all of them. And, um, and it really leads to, or can lead to burnout if we're if we are motivating our children to use all their resources to just try harder and do more in situations where they're struggling, that is um, stacking the deck for burnout. So bottom-up approaches to addressing unmet expectations um, involve really kind of digging deep, really understanding what is contributing to the situation that we're in. So bottom-up processing involves taking in and processing details in order to develop an understanding and arrive at a conclusion. And bottom-up processing tends to be in greater alignment with the way a lot of neurodivergent brains work. Um, you know, I think back to when Matt Lowry came and presented and he showed that beautiful um, rainbow brain filled with hyperconnectivity with all of these sort of neural pathways that are 
this beautiful web of connection. And that that is um, something we often see with neurodivergent folks, which is why, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dig in. I'll, I'll get too far off on a tangent, but but that understanding of how the pieces fit together, of feeling grounded in that I get why we're in this situation and I understand what's happening is um is grounding. It can feel safe and less anxiety provoking to have that understanding. And it helps to then build towards that solution and arrive at that effective solution rather than um, forgetting all of that information as though those details aren't important or essential. So some key principles of the CPS model I like to review, but I'd like to also contextualize it that this is a springboard for what I see as effective communication for problem solving for neurodivergent folks and families. Because once again, this model was not designed with um, divergent neurotypes in mind. But the idea that kids do well if they can is sort of the mantra of the CPS model. And what I um, encourage and what I think of when using this approach is that it's really humans do well when they can. And that's important for a couple of reasons. Number one, neurodivergent kids grow up to be neurodivergent adults. And um, the fact that they do well when they can still applies. Um, but also uh, children do not have a monopoly on struggle and on um, and on becoming dysregulated and um not being their highest and best self when they when their capacity is exceeded. So humans do well when they can. Um, and additionally, that one's capacity or their ability to tap into their skills is not um, uh, varies in different situations. So whether that's a result of asynchronous development or whether that's just a result of one's humanity that we can't always bring our highest and best to every situation at all times is just worth keeping in mind when approaching this model. Um, another key principle is that a problem occurs when an expectation is not consistently met. I talked about that before. And that problem behaviors aren't necessarily due to a lack of motivation, but they really at, at their core represent um, an incompatibility between an individual's capacities in that situation and the demands and the expectations that are being placed upon them. Offering carrots and threatening sticks may not be the solution. In fact, it may make things worse. And that rather than assuming that an adult knows why the problem is occurring and is responsible for solving that problem on their own based on the knowledge that they have, that it's important that both parties investigate and collaborate and work together to solve the problem. Solutions um, in the this framework have to be mutually agreeable and durable, once again, kind of leveling that power hierarchy um, and building them from that bottom up. We have to consider all of the things that we found out and then think about, is this going to be a durable solution to this problem? Um, a tool that's utilized in the CPS model is called the Assessment of Lagging Skills and Unsolved Problems. I, um, once again, I prefer to reframe this and think of it in terms of capacities versus lagging skills. Um, number one, it kind of reduces some of the ableism that's inherent in that idea of lagging skills, like there is a right way to be a person, um, and that if you're not in alignment with that, that you're behind or delayed. Um, but uh that capacities are really what's essential to think about. So for instance, I try to think as I'm as I'm presenting here today that I may have the skill and the ability um, to speak comfortably in front of groups, um, but I don't necessarily have that same capacity if I'm being asked to speak on a topic that I don't know much about, or if I'm under the weather at the particular time, or I haven't had time to prepare. I still have that, maybe that skill, um, but my capacity to, to meet that expectation is gonna vary. And it's very human to have different capacities and to have these capacities vary under different circumstances. Um, and that's helpful, or it is helpful to be aware um, of that issue when trying to understand why someone might be struggling to meet a particular expectation and to problem solve for that struggle is to think about, well, what are their capacities and um, what is the context of this situation and how is that draining on those capacities or exceeding them? Um, and it allows for focused attention as well on the asynchronous development that can be really um, common in neurodivergent kids that just because someone has a capacity like um, they're articulate and they can speak well um, and they're uh, hyperverbal, but 
um, in situations where they're feeling emotionally escalated, that's not a skill that they can tap into and me expecting that they will then explain to me why they got so upset while they are still so upset is not an, a, a reasonable expectation. Um, so I think that this um, tool is helpful because it encourages parents to start to think about the capacities that they have and that their children have. I will I will name that the LSIP doesn't have um, one focus on parents. It really does just focus exclusively on the kids. But um, the way I think about thinking about capacities and how that lends to these situations um, allows for looking at parent capacities as well as child capacities. So for example, if we have a problem here of you know, when I tell my kid that it's time to get off their laptop and get ready for school in the morning, they lose it. They become dysregulated. They scream, they curse, they get loud. Um, and so considering some of those capacities that might uh, show themselves as we look through what are the capacities or look through that assessment of the skills that um, a child has through the ALSEP, it may call attention to the fact that, you know, I know my child has difficulty handling transitions and I know that they have difficulty managing their emotional response to frustration, that they have difficulty sometimes expressing their concerns or their needs or their thoughts in spoken word, um, particularly when they're escalated. So that ALSIP can help with the paradigm shift, um, with this, this beginning to look at, um, it's maybe not just my child being willful or they're not motivated enough, but maybe there's something else that we need to take a, a look at. So um, oftentimes, as I indicated, when a parent comes in for therapy support, they're, they're usually at a point where they're already feeling pretty overwhelmed by the unsolved problems that are present within their household. And um, they often want to fix everything at once and eliminate those problems. But um, while I can validate that and have empathy for that, it is not realistic and it's likely not to be effective. It's going to be overwhelming and feel like too much and then people shut down. Um, so there needs to be some response, however, to problems that occur in real time. And the CPS model um, has three different ways of approaching problems. Plan A is kind of that traditional, my way or the highway, or I'm going to make it difficult for you to not do what I expect of you. And that's really discouraged. Plan B is kind of the meat of the CPS model. It's where you work together to identify the factors that are contributing to the problem and generate these mutually agreeable, durable solutions. Plan C is removing the expectation for now. And I will say that the CPS model sort of acknowledges this as an option of needing to prioritize at times. Um, I think that it is appropriate to, to really highlight this option and at times emphasize that this is a really compassionate, appropriate, and healthy option, particularly if a parent or a child is experiencing burnout or if the neurotype is more aligned with that kind of persistent drive for autonomy, that PDA profile, and imposing a lot of expectations, or um, even having the demand of, um, or the implied demand of, we need to talk about this, we need to work together to solve this problem, may just exceed the capacities that are available and not be healthy. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to breeze really quickly through this, the plan A approach of just kind of superimposing the my way or the highway and using power or pain to strong arm. Um, but to just sort of highlight that, you know, when I tell Joey that it's time to get off the laptop and get ready for school, they curse and scream at me. That's a problem. And so my solution to the problem is that I'm going to ground them and, um, or I'm going to take away you know, the laptop. If you scream at me when I, when I asked you to get off this morning, you don't get it tomorrow morning. Um, so plan B, the goal of the CPS model is that collaborative and proactive solutions piece where both parties' concerns are viewed as equally legitimate and essential to understand in order to solve the problem. Both parties' concerns get addressed in looking for the solution and you problem solve around the predictable problem at a time when it isn't occurring. And that's also something I really underscore and emphasize for parents. Um, the heat of the moment is not the right time to engage in problem solving. When we think in terms of capacities, everyone's capacity to effectively problem solve, um, to access 
logic to use language or process language is downregulated when you are escalated. So this is something to be done outside of the situation. If I know that every morning when I ask Joey to get off the laptop, they curse and scream at me, that's not something I should be talking about with Joey when that's happening. I shouldn't be saying, you can't talk to me that way, or we need to fix this, or you're going to, whatever it is. Um, that's something I can talk about maybe um, at another time on the weekends when we have a little bit more time to connect, to snuggle, to to feel good um, and to feel calm in our bodies, maybe a time to talk about that this is a problem that I'm noticing. This is a struggle that we're having that I don't wanna keep having every morning because it's hard and it doesn't feel good for me and, and it looks like it doesn't feel good for you. And that's a time to start to engage collaborative, collaboratively in the problem solving. And the goal is to generate a solution so that the problem doesn't continue to recur, to reduce that unnecessary human suffering. Um, <clears throat> so, in approaching the collaborative problem solving kind of baked into the model is the idea of um, addressing the double empathy problem. And I know that a lot of people here are very familiar with the double empathy problem, but the idea in a nutshell um, in this lovely uh, cartoon by um, NeuroWild is that historically when um, neurodivergent people are expected to function within relationships with neurotypical folks or within neurotypical systems, that when there's a disconnect, when there's a lack of understanding or a lack of alignment, they're expected to do the heavy lift to address communication breakdowns, to understand the perspective of the other person, to communicate in a way that is in alignment with how that person understands things um, and to accept kind of that neuromajority perspective. And the CPS model um, takes that away. It assumes that the individual with the expectation, which is often the parent or the adult, may not understand what's being communicated by the struggle to meet the expectation. That if someone is struggling to consistently meet an expectation, they're communicating that there is something that's missing that needs to be there in order to consistently meet that expectation. Um, and that by not understanding it, it significantly limits the ability to effectively solve the problem. Um, the CPS model, uh, once again, emph emphasizes that bottom up approach that we approach the problem with curiosity and openness to learn, to understand, and to consider what is contributing to the problem. And um, that means I need to understand what my thoughts are around it, my experiences around it that may be contributing to the problem. And I also need to understand it from the perspective of the other person. It encourages exploration of one's own assumption kind of baked into this process and emphasizes the idea of validation over judgment, that we're taking time to listen to the other person's perspective and to really step in to their shoes and consider it from their perspective. Um, it promotes compassion and self-compassion, and it really underscores the importance of considering and addressing the needs of all parties to generate a mutually agreeable and durable solution. Now, sometimes when I start to introduce this model to parents, what I will what will come up somewhere along the way is some concern about their child's ability to engage in the communication piece of this. Um, that, you know, if I try and talk to my child and get their perspective and solve these problems, they just can't do it. They just shut down the, um, or they're too young. They don't have um, insight or they don't have spoken words or whatever the case may be. There are concerns that are brought up and these are valid concerns, but I try to call attention to the idea that communication is the process of understanding and sharing meaning. Communication is not necessarily words that come out of people's mouths and that there are a lot of components of communication to be considered. So in this process, um, we, we want to consider some things that are being communicated that may not be communicated during uh, the steps of this process that may be communicated as a parent, as I really reflect on, well, you know, Joey struggles to get off the, um, laptop in the morning when I ask them to for school, but they don't struggle on the weekends when they've had a lot of time, when they've finished their game, when they've completed what it is that they want to do, they have a much easier time um, getting off uh, and disengaging and, and transitioning at that time. So considering maybe the context, considering some of the feedback that I'm receiving that, that I may be receiving through nonverbal channels. Um, if a child is, you know, arching their back and stiffening their cute little legs every time you try and put them into their high chair to feed them, um, they're communicating that they're struggling with some aspects of that process. So communication is something that um, 
is available interpersonally in all dynamics. It just um, needs to be explored. And this, this model allows for that exploration. And when we run into challenges with communication, that's something that we can also explore and problem solve around to make this model more available. So the first step in the model is called the empathy step. It's um, where you're gathering information about the problem from the point of view of the person struggling to meet the expectation. So it's acknowledging, usually it's the, the adult taking the lead and acknowledging that there is a problem. So it may, you know, I noticed that you're having difficulty with this thing. What's going on? Like, let's talk about it. And you want to give that opportunity for them to share, well, what is going on for them? Because they have information that we badly need as a dynamic, as, as this um, relationship partners in order to solve the problem. If I, as a parent, have am tasked with the idea that I have to solve this problem on my own without the benefit of any information, um, I'm going to struggle to solve it effectively. It also supports the struggler in identifying and understanding the factors that do contribute to the problem for them. Um, so this form that I'm showing here is called the Problem Solving Plan. It's available through the Lies in the Balance worksheet. It's free and available. Um, and I like it because, as I said, it is a structured model. It's visual for people who um, engage well with that visual path. It does not have to be visual if that's going to be too busy and overwhelming or overstimulating. You can just talk through the steps. Um, the form shows, you see these sort of three different columns. It's because it allows for one to target three different problems. But when looking at just the single problem, you bring that step here. You identify the unsolved problem. I notice um, you know, that, that when I tell Joey that it's time to get ready and put down the laptop, that they curse and they scream at me. And so taking the lead on that problem is, you know, I've noticed that when I ask you to get off of the laptop in the morning before school, that you have difficulty staying calm, what's going on there. Um, and once again, you can, the parent can keep in mind, the adult can keep in mind some of those considerations about their child's capacities that were um, highlighted during the process of going through the ALSA. Now, if there are problems with your child being able to give you the information that you need to feel like you really understand the problem, that you've done all of that kind of bottom-up work to help with the um, with the processing and the problem solving, there are drilling strategies that are encouraged. And I think as um, well, and, and I'll show in a moment, I'll show a, a, another sheet that's available through the CPS website that helps support parents in identifying those drilling strategies that may not come as naturally and intuitively to them. Um, but a lot of these focus on reflective listening, um, who, what, when, where, why kinds of questions, um, highlighting exceptions. You know, I notice that when it's the weekend and it's time to get off your laptop that you, you seem to not struggle when I ask you to do that then. Can you tell me a little bit more about why that's different? Um, it allows for the parent to make observations and be a detective there. And uh, I will, well, I'll talk about more in a little bit some of the other ways that drilling can be available that aren't on the sheet that is available as that drilling cheat sheet through the CPS model. Because once Again, um, it was not designed with neurodivergence first and foremost in mind. Um, and I find that often with a lot of neurodivergent folks and families that using um, other ways to illustrate one's internal experience when it's difficult to identify that on one's own or communicate that in a way that feels like it's understood or understandable to people around you is things like memes, videos, cartoons, stories, other experiences that show other people feeling what you're feeling can help as a channel of communication. And I have an example of this here and I will name that I absolutely love this example. Um, and the cartoon credit is to Aaron Human of Human Illustrations. And um, this cartoon illustrates why it is hard to switch tasks. When I, and, and this could be part of the way that Joey communicates why Joey is struggling to get off the laptop and get ready for school in the morning without losing it. Um, when I'm focused on something, my mind sends out like a million tendrils of thoughts that expand into all of the thoughts and feelings. And when I need to switch tasks, I must retract all of those tendrils of my mind. And this takes me some time. Eventually I can shift to a new task, but when I'm interrupted or I must switch abruptly, it feels like all the tendrils are being ripped out. And that's why I don't react well. So 
please just give me time to switch tasks when I'm ready. And even this communication may not be a complete communication, but it can help a parent do some more of the additional drilling. Thank you so much for sharing that with me. That helps me to understand what you're experiencing. And I can understand that it would be that you would um, get angry or that you would use angry words or a loud tone of voice because that feels like it would really hurt or it would really be difficult. And I'm wondering what might help it feel less like those tendrils are being ripped out. And through that can engage in more of this communication around the problem. And Joey may be able to identify, well, I'm surprised by the interruption because when I'm on my laptop, when I'm in my game, like I am lost in all the tendrils. I am so focused on that. I'm not noticing the passage of time, the cues in my environment that it's getting close to time to get ready for school. So even though you think maybe I should know, I don't, that whenever you come up and you ask me, I'm surprised and I'm shocked and it feels alarming and it feels like those tendrils are being ripped out. And then all of a sudden I feel rushed because now I have to quickly navigate this transition and that's hard. Um, and also sometimes I'm in the middle of my game and I'm playing my favorite game in the morning. Cause I've been playing it lately. Cause I'm like really into this game and I'm trying to navigate through the levels and win the game. And if I stop, I can't pause on this game and I can't save where I'm at. And then I'm going to lose my guy and I'm gonna lose my points. And I've been working really hard at it. And that's really upsetting. And also I don't think I'm yelling and being that loud. Like, and that may be an interoceptive cue. It may be that it's hard for me to understand and regulate my volume, but it also may be that what's my threshold for yelling and being loud is different than your threshold for what's yelling and being loud. That, you know, mom may have some sensory sensitivities here to acknowledge that for her, what feels like yelling is different than for me, what feels like I am yelling. Um, and also I don't, I don't really mean, and I can't always control what I'm saying when I'm mad. That's that awareness that when I am activated emotionally, that it's difficult to refine my speech. So that's all really, really good information that comes out of this step in the process. The next step is um, for the parent, the person who has the expectation to define their concerns. And it allows them to reflect on um, what their, their concerns are related to the expectation, what their perspective is. It also allows them to think through their internalized biases, to think about their values and um, whether their expectations are in alignment with their values. It may create space for some increased flexibility, which in and of itself may um, largely inform the solution to the problem, um, which may be adjust adjustments made on the parent's part. This step also gives the struggler the opportunity to listen, to reflect, to perspective take, to show empathy. It's helping to build skills um, for that double empathy piece. So in this stage, and I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but let's look at what the expectation haver identified as their concerns. That if, um, I, if I don't tell you to get off your game, I feel like I'm responsible to be the one to tell you that you need to get off your game and keep playing, or you're not gonna make it to school because no one else in the household is going to remind you and then you're not gonna get off on your own and, and we're gonna be late. And if you miss the bus, I can't drive you to school. So I'm feeling pressure, I'm feeling keyed up. Additionally, it hurts my ears. I, I am really sensitive to noise and I'm sensitive to the energy and the movement. And I, I get overwhelmed and frustrated when you scream at me. And I know I'm already keyed up and on edge because I'm feeling pressure to get all of the things done in the morning that need to get done. And I'm feeling overwhelmed by the responsibility of it because I'm the only one who's home in the morning to navigate through that. And so I'm recognizing that I'm already keyed up and on edge and it just adds to the stress in the household in the morning. And so we take all of that information now in step three, and that's the invitation to say, okay, we have started to do that bottom up part. We have really dug in. We've learned about what's contributing to this problem. And now like, hey, let's work together to come up with a solution that's going to address those concerns. Um, and that's going to help us uh, identify a mutually agreeable and durable solution to this problem. And so here in this step, we've taken, we've kind of cooked together all of the things that we identified in the previous steps and the mutually agreeable um, solution that was identified here is that we're going to set alarms on the laptop to sound a five minute warning um, and, uh, and an end time. 
um, to get off of the computer. And that takes some of the onus off of the parents, some of that sense of responsibility, that need to monitor, um, and the bringing of the parental stress and energy into the conversation. Also, that ending alarm is going to end 10 minutes before it's time to get out the door. So it it those little alarms are start of that cue to pull back the tendrils. And then there's also less panic about the time that it's going to take to transition and do the final things to get ready at the end of the day. Um, we've also identified that Joey's going to play games in the morning that aren't the ones that can't be paused or where it feels like there's a strong emotional investment to progressing through them so that there's less emotional intensity behind the need to transition away from it. Mom's also going to check in with herself and regulate in the morning before engaging with Joey so that mom isn't bringing her um, stress and anxiety to a situation and kind of amping up what might be there for Joey. And that if Joey is struggling, if Joey does start to scream, mom knowing that that's hard for her and hard on her sensory system is just going to cover her ears with her hands or use headphones or, you know, loop earbuds or what have you, if it's too loud. So she's going to care for and regulate her needs in that way too. So um, we've got our solution to the problem um, and uh, plan B uh, does take work and it does take energy and it may demand additional resources. So I wanted to give a moments of attention to the plan C approach that sometimes the most compassionate response for children and for parents is to remove an expectation for now. Um, learning to let go of things for parents and children can be freeing. It can be a healing experience. Um, it can help to confront some of the ableist ideas and promote values-driven committed actions to start to learn that um, we're going to focus on what works for our family. And that may look very different than the expectations that are in place for other families. And I'm also removing the burden to feel any kind of way about that to justify it. I recognize that for my family, the um, values aligned, compassionate solution is to not demand this of me or of my child right now. So a, an example of plan C in this situation may be that um, identifying that when I tell Joey to get off the laptop, get ready for school, they curse and scream at me. And so I'm just going to wear noise canceling headphones and I'm going to let it go if Joey's struggling on a particular morning. Once again, that may not be the compassionate place to end because we are recognizing that our child is struggling, but it may be the right choice for right now. Um, so in sum, some key considerations um, that I just kind of wanted to wrap up with are that unwanted or unexpected behaviors are social constructs. They're subjective, they're value dependent, um, that society systems and their associated expectations are built for neurotypical folks. And these ableist ideas are often internalized by neurodivergent folks and families and contributes to unnecessary human suffering. And this is a way to begin to highlight that and to break that down. Unmet expectations can lead to disappointment, frustration, and suffering on one or both sides. And if left unexplored and unquestioned and unaddressed, it can cause more problems. It can lead to more suffering. And we're seeking to reduce unnecessary suffering and trauma by understanding and validating different perspectives, by evaluating, questioning, and adjusting expectations and accommodating support needs. And this is a piece, this is a formula for how to do this, for how to engage in effective communication aimed at problem solving um, that shares responsibility and a structured model um, to script communication for problem solving can aid in navigating through problems to effective solutions. And for additional resources that may be of value to you or to um, families that you work with, parents of clients, clients that you're working with directly, um, as I mentioned, I am working to develop online on-demand courses to speak to some of these issues, to focus on um, parent burnout, focused on um, effective communication for neurodivergent folks and families, par um, affirming parenting for neuro neurodivergent kids and families. Um, and this, I always wanna call it a, a UPC symbol. This QR code here, you can scan that um, to be sign up and be notified of the courses as they're developing and when they launch. Uh, two of Ross Green's books are highlighted here, Raising Human Beings and The Explosive Child, which kind of break down and give more information about this model. The Lives in the Balance website um, has a lot of those free resources to help support practice with the model. Um, and I, uh, Amanda Diekman's book, Low Demand Parenting, her website, her parent coach, 
coaching. Um, she is uh, an ADHD parent with autistic kids who um, really kind of works with this model and emphasizes kind of the plan C part of it, compassionate parenting um, to remove demands and to support healing of harm that may have been done or wounds that may have been caused by families, by society, by larger systems um, that are impacting children and how to support that in a healthy way in families. Um, I know I've talked a lot. There is time for questions if people have them. I've also put my information up here, a link to um, my website where you can reach out to me or once again, another QR code that you can scan to get to me. And so I'm now going to remove myself from this bizarro vacuum of speaking without being able to see anyone or get any feedback. I'll stop sharing. And um, thank you so much all for your attention and the opportunity to talk about this, um, this component.